Right. Everyone, welcome back to the second talk of today. Um, so our second speaker of the day is Colin Bleak from University of St. Andrews in Scotland. And his talk is about complexity of the finitely generated subgroups of Thompson's group F. Uh, well, thank you for having me uh, to discuss this, this work with uh, Justin and Matt. Um, it's a bit older work now, but uh, you know, it's still going through the review pipeline as we, you know, these things take, take time. Um, so I, I had uh, a hidden agenda because some people were curious about specific questions you know, deep in the paper, but they're so deep I can't naturally get to them. So I'm going to do one of them, but not the other, hopefully by the end of the talk. Um, and I hope that's okay. And if, if people want to see more details about that stuff, they can talk to me later or maybe next week or something. I'm happy to meet. Okay, so um, so complexity among the finitely generated subgroups of R. Thompson's group F. And uh, I'm really happy to be here again. So thanks for having me. Okay. All right, so the beginning is going to be a bit technical. Um, I'm going to state some results that involve all sorts of uh, things, ordinals, elementary mean and building groups, so on and so forth. Um, and then I'm going to spend a lot of time speaking about what all the definitions are and building some examples and things like that. And then we'll come back and revisit this initial statement. But I want to leave with the theorem, right? So, um, so there's a couple of theorems I want to advertise from this paper. There is a transfinite sequence, um, uh, G nu, uh, for nu less than epsilon naught of finitely generated elementary amenable subgroups of F, such that um, G0 is trivial, and for all nu, uh, G nu plus one, the successor of nu, uh, is isomorphic to G nu plus z. Um, <clears throat> G nu embeds into G theta if and only if nu is less than theta, less than or equal to theta. Uh, and given any ordinal alpha uh, between zero and epsilon naught, and R, some ordinal, which is less than omega, um, uh, set nu to be omega raised to the omega times alpha, the whole thing times two to the R. Uh, if alpha is greater than zero, then the elementary amenable class of G nu is uh, omega dot alpha plus R plus two. Well, okay, so it's something big. You should imagine that alpha is a very large but countable ordinal. If alpha equals zero, then the elementary mutable class of G nu is actually just R plus one. Okay, so the main thrust of this is that we can find um, a load of subgroups of F uh, whose EA class is very high, basically for uh, any small, uh, small enough countable ordinal, small enough meaning less than epsilon naught, which is a special ordinal we'll talk about later. Um, we can find some subgroup of F, which is essentially having that EA class. Um, and we actually also have, it's not advertised in this statement, a subfamily of uh, our subgroups, uh, where all of our subfamily are generated by two generators and their complexity class uh, climbs as high as um, up, up to epsilon naught as well. Uh, and these guys limit their elementary mutable groups, but as uh, marked groups, they limit to a free group on two generators. So, um, so these, so we're finding elementary mutable groups with just tremendous complexity inside of F. Okay. So um, for the next statement, I, I need some objects. Um, <clears throat> scripty S is going to be generating sets for the G nu. Um, S with this little slash on it is going to be the set of finite functions representing elements of scripty S. So each, each, um, okay, it's just, it is what it is. Uh, R with a slash is a subfamily of this, script, of this S with a slash. And less than or equal to is a relation on um, S with a slash. So um, this set of finite functions, those are called signatures. Uh, so it's uh, each finite function is a signature, a signature uh, represents an element of scripty S. And the R is a subfamily of the signatures, and less than is a relation on the signatures induced by the embeddability relation in subgroups of F. So one of the things that, uh, one of the limitations that we have is we're really trying to understand the subgroup structure of, of Thompson's group F, um, but it's just incredibly complicated. So uh, what we do, one of the main 
um, the mechanisms that we employ is we try to understand the subgroup structure up to by embeddability. We say two subgroups are um, you know, more or less the same if you can embed the first into the second and embed the second into the first. And if you just have one embedding the other, then you say less than or equal to, okay? So I don't mean that they actually are proper subgroups, I just mean that there is an embedding uh, in, in the group theory sense. Okay, so our second theorem, now that we have all these objects in hand, is um, for every particular signature you, that you have, there exists another signature, uh, which is unique inside this subfamily R, um, such that um, the signature A is uh, less than or equal to the signature B, and the signature of B is less than or equal to the signature of A. And so in particular, there's corresponding groups and they embed inside of each other. And moreover, there's a natural isomorphism. Um, it actually goes from right to left from the uh, ordinals, which are of type epsilon naught, um, where you have operators uh, is an element of, where you have plus, and where you have exponentiation, essentially exponentiation uh, base omega. And so that's, that's a, 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 you know, it's a structure. Um, it's these ordinals with these operators on them. And there's an isomorphism between that ordered structure of type epsilon naught and our family signatures are under less than um, plus and exponentiation, okay? And so exponentiation is going to be something, you know, plus and exponentiation are going to be things that we will define for our, um, and so there we go. Okay, so those are our two theorems. So, so basically we have uh, really, really complex elementary mutable groups. And in fact, we have a nice correspondence between this subfamily of our groups. Uh, it's in one-to-one -one correspondence with um, the type structure for epsilon naught. Uh, and in fact, um, Everything in S is in is in there, so there's actually a a one to one correspondence between the the type epsilon naught and and our set of signatures. Okay, all all together. All right, so those are our theorems, and now we'll get into um, explaining them with some more background. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> okay, so elementary mutable groups. Um, so. Uh, in 1957, uh, Malon Day uh, introduced the class of elementary mutable groups. It's often called EG, by the way, and it's actually EG in our paper. Um, but I was reading some other sources last week, and they were using EA, so you know my mind my mind got confused. So now it's EA. Okay, so uh, uh, Day introduced the class EA, um, he called it EG, of elementary mutable groups as the smallest class of groups uh, containing the finite groups and the abelian groups and which was closed under four operations, passing to subgroups, taking quotients, taking an extension of one group by another, and taking a directed union of a set of groups, okay? Now the idea was it was very easy to understand that amenable groups satisfy all these, their, the amenable groups are closed under these four uh, actions. And so there were, when, when the elementary amenable groups were introduced, it was, uh, plausible, turned out not to be true, it was plausible that the EA groups would actually equal the class of amenable groups. Uh, and in this way, we'd have a nice way, a sort of a constructive mechanism for getting a hold on every amenable group. Okay, so um, anyway, uh, Ching Chao in 1980 worked out a lot of the basic theory of elementary amenable groups. Um, and he actually showed that you don't need all four operations, you only need the latter two, uh, taking the extension of one EA group by another and taking a directed union of a set of EA groups. Um, and both these papers, the 1957 paper and the 1980 paper are in Illinois, in the Illinois Journal of Math. So, you know, kudos to them. I think that's uh, pretty neat when that happens. Um, anyway, one of the things that, that Chow shows is that the EA, uh, the elementary mutable groups is stratified by subclasses, EA alpha for alpha uh, from the ordinals. And in particular, uh, EA0 is abelian and finite groups. Um, sorry, hold on, I'm setting my timer. I realized I forgot to tell it to go, okay. Um, EA0 is abelian and finite groups. And uh, EA alpha plus one is obtainable from EA alpha by a single application of either uh, triangle or square. 
which is taking an extension of one group by another or taking a directed union of a set of groups. So this is uh, alpha plus one. If alpha is an ordinal, alpha plus one is a successor ordinal. Okay. So you can always get from to the next class, uh, you know, if, if there is such a thing, um, by doing a single application of, of, of triangle or, or square. And then EA alpha um, is actually defined to be the union of EA beta for beta less than alpha when alpha is a limit ordinal because uh, limit ordinals can't be built by successors. Okay, so, um, so this is uh, really nice. There wasn't a lot of structure theory before this, and now there is. Um, okay, so, um, so what can I say about the EA groups? So obviously, um, well, it's not obvious from what's actually above, but each EA alpha itself is closed under taking subgroups and quotients. Um, and because of this, you can define um, the class of, a, of an element communal group G, I'm over here on the right, C of G equals alpha means that alpha is the minimal um, ordinal such that G is in EA alpha, okay? So um, the e element communal groups are actually stratified by these EA alphas. Um, EA is actually equal to all of them, which is good news, uh, so that my last statement will be true. <laughs> um, and, uh, and then, there have been a lot of results about what's actually achievable in terms of EA groups. Um, I think this this might have changed since then, but the strong result I'm aware of is that Olson and Olshansky, um, I think they released this on archive in 2012, uh, for any ordinal alpha less than omega one, um, which is the ordinal first, first uncountable ordinal, um, there exists a countable group G with the class of G equaling alpha. Okay. So, um, uh, kind of, and so this is, you know, this says that uh, for lots and lots of ordinals, there exists EA groups, okay? Um, now, if you look in the standard reference for Thompson's group F, uh, which is this paper by Cannon, Floyd, and Perry, uh, Thompson's group F is not uh, an element immutable group, and they give a nice proof of it. It's, it's not too hard to see, um, and so that's in that paper. So, F is not in EA, but of course we don't know. Of course, you know we, we might suspect, having seen the previous uh, talk by Tony this morning, uh, that that F is perhaps not amenable, um, uh, depending on which side of the war camp you want to get into. But anyway, what is known is that F is not elementary amenable. Okay, uh, and so um, just speaking about amenable groups for a second, uh, the history is Olsh one one part of the history is that Olshansky built. Um, uh, he showed that the Tarski monster is a group that has no free subgroups, but is not amenable. And this was uh, ending the von Neumann uh, conjecture uh, that said that uh, no such things should happen. And then uh, Grigorchuk's um, first group, uh, gamma, is actually amenable, but is not elementary amenable. And, that, and Grigorchuk proved that in 1985. So, um, in fact, there's groups in every difference that you could that you could uh, point to here. Okay. All right. So. Um, Motivating all of this work that I'm going to be speaking on today is the brin sapir conjecture. Uh, every subgroup of F is either elementary amenable or contains an embedded copy of F. Okay, and so a lot of the constructions that I'm going to point to are actually in, intended to um, avoid accidentally getting an embedded copy of F. Okay. Um, by the way, there's some uh, debate as to whether it should be called the brin sapir conjecture. Um, I, I don't know all of the history. There was a period of time where Guba and Sapir were visiting Bryn in Binghamton, uh, and they were talking about these things. Um, Sapir published the conjecture in one of his papers, but I've seen a bunch of emails between Bryn and uh, Guba and Sapir trying to sort out what the name of this conjecture should be, and everybody seemed happy with Bryn and the Bryn-Sapir conjecture, just as a side comment. Um, okay, so um, ordinals and ordinal arithmetic. All right, so uh, you know, I imagine that the the audience is probably mostly algebraists, and depending on your background, you may not really play a lot a lot with ordinals. So, um, an ordinal is the isomorphism type of a well-ordered set, and that's just what we'll run with. Uh, alpha and beta ordinals, alpha less than beta, means there is a well order of type alpha, which is a proper initial part of a well ordering of type beta. Okay. And so that's all, you know, fancy words. Um, if you've not been here before, this could look a little bit confusing. So um, we can turn to not von Neumann for uh, salvation, as it were. Um, <clears throat> so he has a construction which just 
concretely builds the ordinals, right? So um, zero is the empty set. Uh, one is a set which contains zero. Uh, so it's a set which contains the empty set as an element. Two is a set which contains zero and one. And so it's a set which contains the empty set as an element and the set which contains the empty set as another element and so on and so forth. And um, in general, if you look over on the right, uh, von Neumann's uh, construction is uh, from the, the sentence of his, each ordinal is the well-ordered set of all smaller ordinals. And so the successor function, if you have an ordinal alpha is alpha plus one, is basically just alpha union the set which contains alpha, okay? Um, now, if you do this, you, you take all of the successors that you feel like taking, uh, and maybe somebody gets to a million successors, and maybe somebody gets to a billion successors, who knows? But anyway, uh, after some finite iteration of taking the successor function, you get tired. Um, if we imagine uh, all possible finite iterations of successor functions, then that, that allows us to create the naturals. And the first limit ordinal is omega, which is the union of all of those. Um, and so... Um, if A is a set of ordinals, you can always take the supremum of A, which is uh, the union of all the, all the things in A. Um, you have to be a little bit careful uh, to handle the empty set correctly, but that's essentially right. Okay, so uh, we can extend the ordinary arith arithmetic operations on finite ordinals to all ordinals as follows. So we're used to the ones that we do with numbers. Um, you may or may not be used to uh, gen general operations on ordinals. So, um, so here are the definitions. Uh, if you have two ordinals, alpha and beta, then um, if you want to sum them, alpha plus beta, then the answer is just alpha if beta is zero. It's alpha plus gamma plus one if beta is the successor of gamma. And it's um, the supremum of alpha plus gamma uh, when gamma is less than beta if beta is a limit ordinal. Okay. Um, we can also multiply ordinals. Uh, the product is zero if beta is zero. Uh, it's alpha times gamma plus alpha if beta is the successor of gamma. And it's the supremum of alpha times gamma when alpha is less than beta if beta is limited. You see this is the same structure with the obvious caveats that you need to make um, that we're used to from dealing with normal numbers, okay? Um, alpha to the beta is one if beta is zero. Alpha to the beta is equal to alpha to the gamma times alpha um, if beta is the successor of gamma. And um, it's equal to the supremum of alpha to the gamma when gamma is less than beta if beta is limit. Okay. Now, that all seems just like what you might expect it to be, but let's just take note um, the properties of plus times and uh, raising to power. Um, plus is associative, but it's not even commutative. Um, the power is none of the above. It's got no nice algebraic properties as far as that goes. Um, so uh, how do we associate exponentiation? Well, we learned this in school that we associate exponentiation to the right. So alpha to the beta to the gamma means alpha to the beta to the gamma, uh, while alpha to the beta, that result to the gamma is um, alpha to the beta times gamma, okay? And so now I can define this, this ordinal epsilon. Uh, that's right, whatever that notation means. Well, what it means is it's the supremum of this set, which contains omega, omega to the mega, omega to the mega to the mega, and so on and so forth. Um, now, you might, it may not be totally obvious to you that, that these elements in the supremum are all countable, but they are, and epsilon naught itself is countable. Um, and it has this really nice property that if alpha and beta are less than epsilon naught, um, then their sum is less, uh, their sum, their product, and alpha to the beta are all less than epsilon naught as well. So um, it's, it's, you know, a countable ordinal. It's quite large, uh, but somehow it's, you know, still countable, so it's still small. <laughs> all right. So um, let's do a little bit of uh, quick practice. Uh, two times omega 
is the supremum of, since omega is a limit order ordinal, it's the supremum of beta less than omega of two times beta, where now beta being an ordinal less than omega is, is a finite ordinal. So um, that is uh, two times a finite number and those betas uh, get are grow unbounded. And so the supremum of that is actually just omega. And omega is strictly less than omega times two because if I multiply omega times two, then according to my definition for addition, um, that two is a successor of one. So this is omega times one plus omega. Um, then we have to actually figure out what omega times one is. One is a successor of zero. So this is um, omega times zero plus omega plus omega. Omega times zero is just zero. So this just ends up being omega plus omega, which is the supremum of omega plus beta where beta is less than omega. So, um, so, you know, two times omega is strictly less than omega times two. All right. So let's talk about F. <clears throat> so, I, you know, we've seen a talk already about uh, F, so I, I probably won't spend a lot of time introducing F or talking about the properties of it. Um, 1965, Richard Thompson introduced three groups, F, T, and V, uh, under different names and some handwritten notes. Um, F naturally acts on the unit interval of zero to one. Um, T acts on the circle um, and V acts on Cantor space. And um, so these are all groups of homeomorphisms of their respective spaces. Um, but I have these containments, F is less than or equal to T is less than or equal to V because um, you can find realizations of F and T where they're acting on Cantor space as well, okay? So, um, one way to characterize F is uh, it's the piecewise linear homeomorphisms of the unit interval under composition. Um, the elements of F are orientation preserving. They have only finitely many breakpoints where the slope changes. Um, and on the affine parts away from the breakpoints, the slopes are always of the form two to the n where n is an integer. Um, and the breaks in slope only occur over the dyadic rationals, which is z to join a half, which are basically the rational numbers of the form a over two to the b, where a and b are integers. Okay, so here's a sort of a canonical picture that must occur in almost any talk on f. Um, this is one of the, the generators, x naught. Um, they can Floyd and Perry, they actually have the inverse of this is what they call x naught, but I like right actions, so uh, this is what I use. All right, so, um, so the tree pair this is the only tree pair we're going to see the whole time, but it tells you how to, to get this piecewise linear function that you see on the right. So the, the, the caret says subdivide uh, whatever interval you're staring at at that in, in half. So the top caret subdivides uh, the domain zero one into two pieces, which goes from zero to one half and from one half to one. And then the left-hand caret uh, subdivides the left-hand piece into two equal pieces, which goes from zero to one quarter and one quarter to one half. Meanwhile, the range has a different subdivision rule. You split the whole interval into two halves, so the zero to one half and one half to one in the range. And then you take the right-hand interval, which is the bigger interval from one half to one, and you split that in half again. And now you have three um, intervals, and you take them to each other in the normal natural order by homeomorphism of the unit interval. Um, and so zero to one quarter is being stretched to zero to one half, and that's a slope to a line going through zero. Uh, one, half, one quarter to one half is being sent to one half to three quarters. That's a slope one uh, uh, affine part. Um, and then from one half to one is being sent to the final quarter, three quarters to, to one. And so that's a slope one half uh, transformation. Okay, so, um, so we have these tree pairs corresponding to these uh, functions of the type that I've described above. Okay, well, um, it's actually quite painful if you try to uh, draw <laughs> elements of F because you know they're blocky, they they have uh, lots of little breakpoints and there's subtleties and you know it's it's a lot of work. And so um, there's this diagram notation that that we like to use. Um, it's, and so I'm going to draw it over here. So what what you do is you basically um, uh, the process is described below. I'm just going to give you the short version of it. You subtract the um, from F. I've got F in purple and G in blue, if you can see those. So I'm going to subtract from F the, the identity function. So F minus the identity. 
And what that does is it takes this diagonally slanting graph and it, and it makes it run horizontally. And so the horizontal line over on the right hand side that, um, that we don't see all of, I'm going to just sketch it in right now, but I, I, even though I don't, uh, I don't do this normally, but it'll help you to see it. So you could imagine that the uh, x axis, uh, the line y equals x corresponded to this horizontal line going right here. Okay, and it goes all the way to one. Okay, but um, it's not really interesting what's happening when f is acting like the identity. So in general, we don't draw anything uh, between the transition points. So f basically consists of two, two components of support. Um, and between, uh, between B and C, um, F is acting like the identity. And so B and C are these transition points where you switch from support of F to, to, to not. And um, so I don't draw a straight horizontal line there because it's just you know, too much work basically. And so uh, we just draw the bumps. And then also I'm super lazy, so I don't really wanna draw the the PL-ness of it, it's just a pain. So I just do a little curve. And so F has a, a, an up bump and a down bump. And what that corresponds to, if I took a point, um, let's say this point T that I'm gonna draw on the graph, here's T, and I plug it in, then you know we understand that it, it goes up to the graph of F and then goes over to the, to the line Y equals X and it comes down and we see that T has been made bigger uh, by applying an F to it. And so uh, up bumps correspond to places where the function is, is increasing the value of the, what you're putting into it. And down bumps, um, the opposite. You know, when you're in a down bump, you plug it into the function, then you actually make the bump uh, less. Okay. So, um, so what I have over on the right-hand side is a picture of what I call a, a, a diagram for this collection of elements. Um, what you have to pay attention to is where are the transition points. So you need to maintain your horizontal axis uh, firmly. Um, and then the only other information you really care about is when is something uh, increasing and when is something decreasing. So is it an up bump or a down bump? And so, um, so this picture on the right is something I might draw in, in my hand research on this. Um, I usually don't draw these vertical dotted lines coming down tracking my uh, transition points, but I do uh, when I have to be careful. Okay. Um, so this is the rules. You, uh, you take your function, you subtract the identity function. You don't bother drawing the x-axis in the result. Um, horizontal location matters. You have up bumps that look like up bumps and you have down bumps that look like down bumps. Um, in this picture, f is two, up, uh, two, two bumps. One is up and one is down. And g also has two bumps. Um, the left one is down and the right one is up. Okay. So formally, <clears throat> a bump is a homeomorphism of the interval uh, so that the support um, is a single connected open interval, okay? And the support is all the things that the bump moves, right? So um, for elements of the homeomorphisms, the orientation preserving homeomorphisms of the interval, they can decompose as a set of disjoint bumps. And if that set is finite, then you could just take the product of those bumps um, under composition of homeomorphisms in any order and you'll get the original element. And the order doesn't matter because the supports of the bumps are disjoint from each other. And so they, their action doesn't interfere with each other at all. Okay, so uh, it's very nice to be able to decompose uh, elements in terms of the bumps that are involved in their, uh, in their big picture structure. Okay, so. <clears throat> all right. Um, so this is where we're getting into what is really the new territory, okay? So there's another paper. I'm just going to put enough information here to explain one of the main results of that. It's a five author paper with um, uh, Matt Brinigan, Martin Kasabov, uh, Justin Moore, um, Matt Zaremski, and myself. And uh, what we do is we define these things called fast groups, okay? So, um, one of the things you can do with a bump, and then here's how we're going to get to defining fast groups. One of the things you can do with a bump is you can mark it. And when I say mark a bump, what I mean is uh, if you have a bump B, a marking of B is a choice of a point in the support of B. And once you've chosen that point, that's going to determine uh, what we call a left foot, a middle, and a right foot. 
So here I have a picture um, right here. And um, you can see it, it looks like a pair of pants with two feet sticking out. <laughs> there's a left foot, which is going from R to M of B. The marking is M of B. And there's a right foot, which goes from wherever M of B goes to under the action of B to S, which is the right-hand side of the support. So the support of B here is going from over the interval from R to S. And then, of course, you have the middle, which is the territory between the bumps. Um, the middle essentially corresponds to a single fundamental domain, except that we're very careful um, that the right foot always is ha half closed. Uh, the left foot is always open, and um, the middle is always open. So the middle is not in what normally people would call an honest fundamental domain, because you'd need to take one of those endpoints normally. Okay. Now, that's the picture for an an up bump. For a down bump, you do the same thing, but of course the down bump is decreasing the value of things that you plug into it. So if you pick your marker M of B, then uh, a fundamental domain away to the left is M of B dot B, which is where B sends M of B. And so then your left foot goes from R to M of B dot B, the right foot goes, um, oops, that's an error. Uh, okay, the picture is correct, and the the things in the graph are not right. <laughs> um, so, easy to fix. That should be that. Uh, right, so the left foot goes from R to M of B dot B, that's correct. The right foot goes from M of B to S, that's correct. And the middle, uh, apparently I thought I don't really want to commit to some kind of uh, location, uh, but it's going to go from here here to there. So m of b dot b is going to go to m of b. Okay. So, um, all right. Sorry about that. Okay. So um, left foot is open, right foot is closed, half closed. So um, if you have a collection of marked bumps where you've picked markings like this, you say that that collection is fast um, if and only if for any two feet that you find, um, respectively of bumps B1 and B2, um, if the feet touch each other at all, if they intersect each other, then that implies that the feet are actually equal, and not only are the feet equal, but they belong to the same bump. Okay, So um, it's a fast collection, it means that you can find a marking where, given two distinct bumps, their feet are totally disjoint from each other. Okay, And uh, in particular, we want to generalize this to a collection of elements of homeo plus i. We say a collection of elements of homeo plus i is fast if and only if the set of bumps that you get for that collection s. Um, so, you know, this, these are all the bumps b such that there is some function f inside of s so that b is a, a bump of f. So you need that that set of bumps admits a marking that makes it fast. And also you need that no two distinct elements of s, two distinct functions, they can't share a bump. Um, so you can't have two things in S which, you know, both have a bump in common and then otherwise, you know, do whatever they do. Okay. If, if you, if you share a bump, you're, you're, the, you're the same, uh, same actual elements. Okay. So here is an example. Um, <clears throat> so here is two elements, T and B. And in gray, I've, uh, selected, um, my feet. Okay. And, I, and I'm, I'm imagining that T and B are fast. Okay, so um, you can perhaps see the way I've drawn it. I've tried to draw it so it's clear enough that um, if, I, if I look at all of my feet, they all miss each other. This one's the tight one. Now, of course, it's just by eye, so I can cheat and make this line curvy and, and whatnot. But the point is, um, this would correspond, if you can find such a set of markings, then you have a fast uh, collection. So, so, so here, T and B are fast, because all the feet are disjoint. You can find markings such that all the feet are disjoint. Um, and um, that's already enough for me to know what is the isomorphism type of that group. And it doesn't matter PL or not PL. This is actually true in homeo plus of I. Um, and we will see the corresponding theorem is going to be that this isomorphism type is now completely determined. Okay. 
All right. Anyway, if I have um, a fast set of bumps, there we go, get, give myself some more space. If I have a fast set of bumps or a fast set of uh, uh, fast set S of elements of Hilling plus of I, once I know what's fast, then I can represent all the information that I need to without actually drawing everything. Although actually the thing I'm going to draw looks an awful lot like this, this picture we have above anyway. But anyway, we have this thing called the dynamical diagram of, of S. Okay, so you, you have a, a fast set, which means you've got a, a marking that makes all the feet disjoint. Um, so we're gonna build this dynamical diagram and dynamical diagram is a combinatorial object which represents the generators T and B. It's a directed edge labeled graph on a linearly ordered set of vertices. And the vertices are the transition points um, of your elements uh, in the order induced by the reals. And if, um, if R and S are two transition points and R is less than S, uh, and those are, so these are vertices in your dynamical diagrams, um, if there are transition points of a bump B belonging to some function F and S, then I will draw a directed edge from R to S um, if it's an up bump, and I'll draw the directed edge from S to R if it's a down bump. Okay, and it, you know, it's just sort of natural that when you draw these directed edges, if it's an up bump, you actually draw it as kind of an up bump edge. And if it's a down bump, you draw it as a down bump edge. And in this case, once you get used to doing that, you no longer have to draw the arrows because you understand which ways they go. Okay, so um, another thing that we do, because it doesn't actually impact the isomorphism type of the group, is um, if we want to avoid clutter, we usually identify successor transition points, R1 and R2. If R1 and R2 are transition points, um, only of one particular element F. And if the interval from R1 to R2, that element F acts like the identity. So over on the uh, right hand side here, I've got this picture, whoops, this thing is hopping all over the place. A little bit hard to control it. Okay, so, okay. Um, so over on the right-hand side, I have uh, two bumps from F drawn. There's a gap between the two bumps. And uh, what we actually do is we just nudge those bumps together. So there's still a single fixed point transition between the up bump and the down bump. This won't impact, if you have a fast system, um, there's nothing in between there. This will not impact the isomorphism type of the group that results, um, but it does simplify your dynamical diagram because you have one fewer vertices. So if I have the picture that we, we had above, uh, this uh, S curve for T and um, the single bump for B, uh, this gives me the dynamical diagram that I've drawn here. And notice the edge labels are labeled by the group elements, okay? And then our theorem is, if you have uh, two fast generating sets, S1 and S2, um, for homeo plus of I with isomorphic dynamical diagrams, then the induced bijection from the set S1 to S2 induces a marked isomorphism of groups from S1 to S2, from the group generated by S1 to the group generated by S2, okay? So um, what does this mean? This means that if you have a collection of generators and their endpoints are you know, basically far enough away from each other, uh, the transition points are far enough away from each other, then you could raise those generators to powers until they become fast. Because what happens when you raise them to powers is that the middle gets long and the feet get small. And when the feet are small and the middles are long, you have a fair chance to make all the feet miss each other. And as soon as that happens, the isomorphism type of the group is completely determined and the group, it will not change when you raise the powers to uh, raise those generators to power any further powers, okay? Um, so here's some examples of some fast groups. All right, do four of them. Here's F and G right next to each other, but with disjoint support. So that, that makes Z plus Z. Um, it's quite easy to pick any markings you pick. The feet will be disjoint. This is the upper left-hand corner here. Um, if I go down, if I have F as a big bump and G as a small bump sitting inside of it, if we're fast, the feet of G are disjoint from uh, the feet of F, and therefore all of the support of G is in the middle. And so um, that means that if I conjugate G by F, the resulting creature that you get, if you, if you considered in this bottom guy, if I look at, uh, hold on. Oh. I've got some uh, weird video uh, thing. 
coming up here. Okay, good. So, right. Okay. So if I consider uh, G conjugated by F, and I look at its support, then that will be totally disjoint from the support of G. And so what that means is that the F element acts like a top generator Z. The G element acts like a bottom generator Z for a wreath product, a standard restricted wreath product, Z wreath Z, which we have saw in, in a previous talk. Okay. Um, on the other hand, if uh, uh, is it? Okay. So what's happening is that my computer is actually overheating <laughs> and it is not responding very well to um, me attempting to get it to do anything. So uh, I probably will do, do very little drawing. All right. So um, right. So. On the other hand, if F was not fast with respect to G, then the conjugate of G by F would overlap itself. And I'd have uh, G and the conjugate of G by F essentially looking like the picture in the lower right-hand corner, except it'd be two down bumps. And as you see, I claim that the picture in the lower right-hand corner is R. Thompson's group F. So if this, if this group uh, on the lower left, if F was actually slow, not fast, I should say, then that group would contain a copy of F and would immediately become uh, not elementary amenable. All right. Um, so uh, going into the upper uh, right quadrant, this is the example from above. We had these two generators, uh, T and B, and you heard discussion in the previous talk about the Bryn Navas group B. So these are, these are the guys that generate the Bryn Navas group B. If you assume T and B, you raise them to sufficient individual power so that they become fast. Um, then you get the Brinavis group B. And if you do something that's a little bit too slow, then what's going to happen is um, you can actually take B, conjugate B by T, and you would get a uh, wider version of B. And then the conjugated B to the T uh, will act like a top generator conjugating the B, like the picture in the lower left-hand side. But if things are too slow, then you get a copy of F. So it's only when it's fast that you're guaranteed that uh, you don't get any F. And so the Brin novice group B, if your elements were just a little bit too slow, suddenly that you just get copies of F sitting in there just like running rampant, okay? And then finally, uh, we have R. Thompson's group F is the canonical picture are just these two generators, two bumps. Um, and if this is a fast system, you get Thompson's group F. So uh, this is a really nice ubiquity type result that basically says, if you take a group of homomorphisms of R, it's really hard to avoid F. Okay, it's not even in the PL category anymore. Okay, now the result that that's F uh, is in our fast generator paper, which is in, in um, the Journal of Combinatorial Algebra. Um, and it was also uh, discovered independently by Kim, Coberta, and Loda in their pap paper, Chain Groups of Homomorphisms, which is, uh, you know, uh, published in the ENS. Okay, so, and in fact, if you use like three bumps in a row and you can carry on this, then you get F3, and if you do four bumps, you get F4, and so on and so forth. So, um, it's, it's a really nice, uh, nice, this is a really nice paper on the chain groups. Okay, anyway, so the, the takeaway message is fast groups have stable isomorphism type. All right, um, so now, I want to get back to our study of EA groups. So hopefully I've convinced you that uh, FAST is a good way to start to help avoiding Thompson's group F because you can uh, try to make sure you don't get any of these kinds of weird overlaps that, that force an F. Um, and so um, in fact, you want a lot of control on the elements. And so we're going to look at specific families of generators. They're going to be highly structured. And so here we go. So a standard function, is a marked uh, homeomorphism uh, with finitely many bumps so that the following things happen. If you take the support of the homeomorphism and you take its closure, and then you take the interior of that. So the, the over bar means take the closure and the little circle means take the interior in my notation. 
then that's an interval. And um, it, if you want that every up bump is to the right of every down bump. So the down bumps are going to be on the left hand side, the up bumps are going to be on the right hand side. And finally, you want that the number of up bumps is either equal to or one greater than the number of down bumps. So I have some pictures. Um, the, the pictures on the left are standard. Uh, in the first picture, we have one down bump and two up bumps. So there's one extra up bump. The, the, there are fixed points in the interior. There's two transition points in the middle that are fixed. But if I take the closure, they disappear. And then if I take the interior of that, we just get the open interval from the far left of the support of the element to the far right of the support of the element. Okay. The second one down, it looks like this S generator in the Brin Novice group, that's standard. And the third one down is just a single up bump, that's standard. So, um, so in the first and third examples, we have one extra up bump compared to down bumps, and in the middle example, they're equal. Non-standard on the right-hand side. Um, so the, firstly, it's two up bumps and no down bumps, so we fail on the counting, but we also fail because there's a gap between the bumps. So if I took the closure and then the interior, I don't get an interval, I just get uh, two intervals. Um, the middle one looks like it could be standard, except that it's starting with an up bump and then going to a down bump, and that's uh, no good. We want to start with down bumps and then go up bumps. And the last one is no good because it's just a single down bump, and if you only have one, it has to be an up bump. Okay, so a set, and the reason we want this, this is going to give us combinatorial control over the groups that we generate, okay? So a set A of standard functions um, uh, forms an element of this scripty S set, which is, if you remember from my uh, leading in page, this is one of the sets of uh, sets of generators that are going to be allowed for our calculations for EA class. Um, so a set A of standard functions forms an element of scripty S if and only if each pair of distinct functions from S forms a standard pair in some order. Now, we don't know what a standard pair is. We just so far only know what a standard function is. Okay. Um, so to get standard pair, I have to actually do some, uh, a bit of involved work. Okay, so imagine that F and G are homeomorphisms um, and that they're standard functions, all right? Right, F is much, much less than G. If the uh, closure, the interior of the closure of the support of F is to the left of the closure of the interior of the support of G. So everything in the, in the closure of the interior, in the interior of the closure of the support of F, every point there, is to the left of every point in the interior of the closure of the support of G. Okay, um, so that's F is you know way less than G. Um, right F and then this uh, square cap symbol G. I'm going to read that as uh, F is dominated by G to say that the closure of the support of F is contained inside the interior of the closure of the support of G. So um, that, that's sort of like in the Z3Z case where the bottom group has his, his whole intervals contained fully inside the support of the, of the top generator. And finally, just write F is less than G if um, F is either uh, much, much less than G or F is dominated by G. Okay, so um, in the top picture, F is much, much less than G. And in the bottom picture, F is dominated by G. Um, so uh, once we have this less than established, um, you might notice that there's actually an ordering on, uh, if you had a, a set of functions uh, which were less than in this way, then it's the case of the rightmost transition point of the lesser function is to the left of the rightmost transition point of the greater function. So you could also use like the, the rightmost transition points of the functions uh, to determine an order on the elements in this case. So, um, in fact, you can define standard elements, uh, standard functions recursively. So, in the general case, if you have a complicated standard function and you drop the outer two most bumps, um, the leftmost bump, which in, for big enough systems will be a down bump, and the rightmost bump, which for big enough systems will be an up bump, if you just flatten that out so it acts like the identity over that region and otherwise you do exactly what the function was doing everywhere else, then you write a little circle above the F. This doesn't mean power zero. This means uh, like we call this like rotation or um, you know, it's just dropping the outermost orbitals. So it's this F to the circle thing. And so um, 
basically, if you took a standard function and you reversed this operation, then you can build a bigger standard function. And, um, and then we need to know what happens when things are small. If f has only one or two bumps, then um, going from f to f circle is you just uh, replace f by a tiny little bump living inside the left foot of f, fully inside the left foot. And if, and if f has two bumps, um, then you replace f by a single bump function whose support is entirely in the left foot of the up bump of f, because there will be only one up bump. Okay. So, um, so this is it. You can start with, uh, if you feel like it, a, a single, um, uh, you can start with the identity, actually. Uh, we, you can formally technically define, uh, well, okay, let's, let's avoid that. Um, so let's start with a single bump. And if you start with a single bump, then you can uh, always build a more complicated bumps using these things. You're going to need this extra base case of having this, this uh, generator uh, that looks like the top element of the Brin novice group. Um, it makes all writing all arguments become quite complicated because you have to do extra base cases. But uh, essentially, between just a single bump and and that one, uh, you can you can carry on to get you know all of the standard functions. Okay, so now if I have a standard, uh, if I have two standard functions, then um, the pair f comma g is going to be a standard pair, and this is an ordered definition. Um, Firstly, if the set f comma g is fast, so there's there there exists a marking of f and g such that you get a fast system. And secondly, either f is far to the left of g, or f is dominated by g. But the further condition that if I uh, strip g of these outer two most uh, orbitals, um, then that's now a standard pair where the g the strip version of g is now being uh, less than f. Okay, so in the ordered pair, the small one is the one we list first. Okay, and so here's an example. Uh, I have on the left-hand side a G and F. G has uh, three bumps and F has two. If I uh, strip G, I delete its two outermost bumps. Then what's left over is a single bump, which happens to just uh, still straddle the transition, the interior transition point of F. And now if I um, if I strip F, it's, it's in this weird case of uh, two bumps becomes a single bump inside the left foot of the up bump of F. So I get a single bump uh, it, of F underneath uh, the stripping of G. And then um, if I then strip G again, I get a single bump in the uh, left foot of G naught. And so that's G zero zero. And uh, at this point, we are finally in the case where F is, where one of our guys is strictly uh, less than the other. Is much much less than the other and so we're done it's a standard pair okay so standard pair is uh any function any 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 pair such that when you iterate this process you eventually get to um this sort of disjoint uh picture okay while while remaining uh, uh you know a good a good set along the way okay so this guy is actually a standard pair it's complicated but it's it's doable now um what are we trying to avoid just really fast Imagine in the left-hand picture here, if G, if it's if it's right-hand bump, uh, if its right-hand bump is an up bump and its left-hand bump is an up bump, then when I conjugate F by G, F will effectively move to the right. But because there's interior fixed points of G, it won't be moved entirely off of itself, and so you end up getting a picture of F, where F and F to the G generate a group, and the support of F. Uh, lives on the right-hand side, uh, but not on the left-hand side of the support of the group. And the support of F to the G lives on the left-hand side, but not on the right-hand side of the support of the group. And the support of the group is just one big interval. And that's exactly uh, this condition by Matt Brin found called the ubiquity condition, which says you, for sure and guaranteed you're going to have a copy of F. Okay, so we need this sort of alternating structure of the, the bumps on the outside doing opposite things in order to, like as, as the first initial condition that just avoids F. Because um, remember, F is not EA, okay? So a standard generating set uh, is any finite generating set A such that every subset of two distinct elements admits an order such that they are now a standard pair. So, um, and script ES from uh, the main results page is the set of all uh, subsets of homeo plus i 
such that A is a standard generating set. So you've got like, you know, 50 things in there, but if you grab any two of them, then they're, they themselves are um, a standard pair under one of the orders, okay? So um, just, to, just to go back to the main results page, this is the scripty S from the main results page. Um, these are the generating sets for our G sub, sub mu. Okay. All right. So um, those are standard things. Right. So uh, oscillation and signature. So just like we could boil a fast generating set down to a dynamical diagram, uh, the information in a standard generating set can actually be boiled down to a finite matrix of non-negative integers, which we call the signature of the set A. Okay, and I use the double bar whenever I'm using the signature function, and I use uh, just the regular A for, this, for the generating set. Okay, so if F and G are a standard pair of marked functions, um, then we have to define something called their oscillation in order to understand what this, this signature is. Okay, and the oscillation, OFG, is the number of orbitals of G that contain at least one transition point of F. So I have this picture with G and F. G has three bumps and F has two, but every orbital of G contains a transition point of F, and therefore the oscillation of F with G is three. Okay. Now, um, if A is in these uh, happy signatures, you know, the ones that are standard generating sets, if A is a standard generating set, then the signature of A is literally just the function uh, for every pair that is a standard pair, um, you know, you just write down the oscillation. So, so this is a function, um, but that function itself can be arranged as a matrix, and I'll show that below, okay? Anyway, the generating set A is called the base of the signature, uh, and it's formally part of the data, um, and we need it on, on occasion, okay? So, um, here is uh, four elements, A, B, C, and D. It's uh, somewhat complicated. There's their dynamical diagram, which is all you need to specify what, you know, what the elements are. And you can literally just start counting whose transition points are inside the support of everybody else. And um, the picture that you get is this one. Okay. D is the biggest uh, element. It starts in the far left and goes to the far right. Uh, D only has two orbitals, uh, has two, two bumps to it. And um, every one of the elements, A, B, and C, uh, actually have transition points in each of the uh, bumps of D in the support, in, in, in the support of the bumps of D. And so uh, the, the oscillation for D with C, or I should say OCD, is uh, two. And uh, exercising my OCD, the oscillation of, of B with D is two, and the oscillation of A with D is two. Similarly, um, the oscillation of B with C is two, and the oscillation of A with C is two. Um, C itself has two bumps, and you can see them. C is the second most widest function, and uh, again, uh, A and B both have transition points inside each of the bumps of, of C. And then finally, we have uh, uh, B. Now, B is tricky. Um, B has three bumps to it. And if you look at the three bumps, you will discover that each one of those bumps contains a transition point of A. And therefore, the oscillation of um, A with B is three, okay? And so, um, so this is a, the matrix that contains all of the information about how our standard functions in the standard generating set are interacting. And so that matrix just has everything. Um, and so the thrust of our work, what we've actually done, is we, we build processes that you can realize uh, for groups, for actual homeomorphisms, you know, like stripping off the outer, bulb, outer bumps, these kinds of things, or, you know, taking two generating sets and slide, putting them down next to each other so that they're disjoint from each other. And then, you know, we figure out what those operations do to the signatures. And as long as we're in one of our standard uh, generating sets, um, it turns out that uh, we can prove, and it's, incredibly complicated, but we can prove that the resultant group is an elementary immutable group. Uh, and uh, the complication, the, the way that that proof goes, um, I'll just give a little bit of a hint here because I'm probably not going to get into it in, in any real detail, is if you consider this element D, it generates a Z. And um, basically, 
you have some kind of uh, really complicated uh, group where it's you, you, you take the group generated by A, B, and C, and then you can conjugate that group around by the action of D, which is acting like a top generator. And so what you get is that the whole group generated by A, B, C, and D is actually uh, some kind of really, really nasty H and N extension uh, with top element generated by D, which is generating a Z. And so we can strip off that Z as long as we get enough of what's inside, what's, what's underneath it. Um, and, uh, and then so we just sort of fluff up everything underneath it to make it a really, really complicated picture down there. Uh, and then we throw away our top generator. And what we can prove is that the result of that is actually provably less complex than what we started with. And so, um, so this is like what our operation does. Uh, this is called a stripping operation. And so, um, yeah, so that's, that's, you know, basically what we, what we do. And then the point is that it was already understood for a long time that these elementary immutable groups uh, in these torsion free groups uh, would have these sort of top, top Z generators. So um, it wasn't actually a surprise that we found this structure actually. Okay. Um, right, so I'm into the, the big picture story. Okay, so what is our goal? Um, so the goal is this theorem, like for any not too large ordinal alpha, uh, there is uh, some alpha, alpha prime, another ordinal, um, such that uh, G alpha prime is uh, a subgroup of F um, and it's elementary amenable with the class being actually alpha um, or, you know, roughly alpha. Like this is obviously not as complicated a statement to the theorem as on the, on the lead page, which is the technically correct version. But basically for not too large ordinals alpha, we can find something inside of F, a subgroup of F, which is elementary amenable with, with roughly that class. Okay. So how does it actually go? So, um, the first thing is we prove that any oscillation table that you build for a triple of generators can be realized. And we generate all possible generators um, actually using just two operations. So um, if you have two generating sets, you can take their disjoint union, which I'll call plus, and um, that's going to produce a, a direct product of groups. So what you do is you just take the generating sets for A, and you put it to the left and you take the generating set for B, B and you put it to the right and you make sure that the supports are totally disjoint from each other. If that happens, then these groups commute with each other. They don't interfere with each other. So you just get A plus B as a direct product of groups. And in the signature table, that looks like what I've drawn here in this little matrix. Okay, you just, you get the, the B is the dominant stuff because it's to the right-hand side. So it's in the upper left-hand corner of this that triangle. You get zeros because the oscillation of anything from, with A, from A to anything with B is zero because the support of A never touches the support of B. And so you get this, this picture, okay? So this is uh, direct sum. Then we have this exponentiation operation, which we can do to a signature. And what it does is every oscillation in sight, you just add one, okay? And we, re and we prove that you can realize this, that you can always, you can always do this. And, and it's actually not so hard to imagine that you can do this. Um, if you if you were to draw some some uh, some generators and you say how can I actually raise all the all of the relative signatures up by one, all the relative oscillations up by one, you can uh, possibly guess to yourself that you can just add a bump in the right place at each signature and and get the job done. And you can, um, but it's actually a, a bit complicated. So I'm going to show something else in in a, in a couple minutes that that sort of like makes life a bit better. Okay. And then we don't actually need the following operation, but we also have this, this one. Uh, if I have three different uh, standard generating sets, A, B, and C, um, I'm gonna write A is equal to B uh, star C. Now this does not, these are generating sets, these are not groups, right? So this is just a formal operation. It's like, I guess, a ternary operator. And what it is, is um, uh, C is the union of A and B, where um, A is less than B for every A and A and B and B, and also the oscillation of A with B is always one. And so you can actually build this thing. And if you do build this thing, um, then it's really, really cool what you get. Because in that situation, uh, what you're actually getting is that the... Um, Okay, so let me see, I have this equality here, A equals B star C, uh, and um, if all of the signatures, uh, F, G, 
um, for all the elements. Uh, I, I didn't I didn't finish writing this, but I should have done. Uh, so I think you need FG standard inside of B. If all the oscillations inside of B are one uh, or greater, um, then when you build this construction, that you actually get that A is actually equal to a, a strange wreath product. It's called it's a permutational wreath product. It's not the standard restricted wreath product, but A becomes this, this permutational wreath product of B with C. And um, let me just uh, point out a result of Brin's. Uh, let's see, it's, it's down below. Um, okay, well, uh, I'll come back to this permutation wreath products, but it has a strong impact on EA class, okay? And so um, if I take my signatures, if I wanna build a signature, uh, so now I'm here, I'm talking about these R signatures. So I wanna go back to the first page and the main results. If you remember, there was this uh, S or the standard generating sets, S the, the hash is the, the signature functions for the standard generating sets. And then this R with a hash was a subfamily of S. And we have a claim that the order type of R with less than plus and exponentiation is equivalent to the order type of epsilon naught under the standard operators that we have over there. Okay. So this subfamily R is, is a really super important family. And so in this big picture story, um, we can actually do this process if I want the signature of the uh, ordinal alpha dot beta, then I can just literally do this star process for the signature for R of alpha with the signature of R of beta. And we can actually realize this thing, okay? All right, so, um, so that starts to give you a hint that we can start to construct the ordinals that we want inside of our R set. Okay, so um, if, a is a, if A is a standard generating set, and a bar, you know, a double bar is a signature, then let's set uh, e of a to be exp exp of a. So this means we've increased every signature in sight by two. Okay, and I can, I'm at, if time allows, I'll actually show you how to do this because it's, it's not too hard. Okay, so um, what do we get? If a and b are inside of s and uh, a is actually e of b, then the oscillations um, for F and G is at least two everywhere because all signatures went up by two. Um, and furthermore, B is equal to um, the, the stripping of F for every F inside of A. And that's actually the clue. How do you actually do uh, this uh, E operation? So what you do is you, you look at all the things inside of A and you take the smallest one and you undo a stripping. You add two bumps on the outside that start at the end of the transition points and go uh, to the outside of all the other elements that you see supported. So that new element, which is like uh, undoing a circle operation to F, is now bigger than everybody. And then you do that with the next smallest guy. And then you do it again with the next smallest guy and so on and so forth until you've done it to everybody. Ciao. Buongiorno. Ciao. Ciao. Eh, mi sono accorto. Scusa l'attesa, che questo tizio doveva finire, ma Hold non on, sta chatting going on here. <laughs> okay, so I'm almost done. Okay, so um, so once you do that operation, you do this, uh, you undo the circle thing to every element in your set from the bottom to the top, then that actually carries out this, this E construction and that actually produces uh, raising all the signatures up by two. So you can actually check it. Um, I will do it right now for a two element set. Okay, so here is uh, one generator, and here's another. So let's call this guy uh, T and B, the top and bottom. If I first uh, impact the B, then I need to put a down bump here and an up bump there, and now that's become bigger. And now I'm going to do the same thing to T. T is going to get bigger and smaller. And now we observe that the oscillations, so originally it was the oscillation of B with T was two, and now the oscillation of B with T is four. And so that everybody went up by two. So that's exactly what we do. Okay. So um, there's a prop proposition in our paper that says, um, if you are in one of the fancy signatures R, if you're in this fancy set R, then either you are uh, e of B for some B inside of R, 
or there's a B and C inside of R, which are not zero, uh, such that A is equal to B plus C under this direct sum operation that I told you how to do. Or uh, there is a B and C inside of, of R not zero, um, such that A is equal to B star C, which means that A is actually this sort of permutational reef product of B with C. So in particular, for every A in, in, uh, in R, you can express it uniquely uh, in terms of the operations of plus star and this double exponentiation. And you need this constant Z for like a single bump in the Z generator at the base, okay? And the reason that's, that's super important is that we can actually translate the Cantor normal form of any ordinal into these signature operations. And um, the, the mechanism for this, uh, one of the connections to the mechanism this is a core older result of Brin, which says that the class of, of uh, a group G plus one is equal to the class of this permutational risk product that I mentioned to you of G with G uh, less than or equal to that, which is less than or equal to the class of G plus two. And this is in his paper from like 2005, I think on elementary mutual subgroups. Um, but if G is a kind of group such that when you take the infinite direct sum of itself with itself countably many times, that doesn't change the EA class, such groups exist. And in fact, everything that is appearing inside the constructions that I've done today have this property. Then the class of the permutational reef product is actually just the class of G plus one. So this is how you build the successor function uh, on the group theory side. And so this is, uh, I guess, all that I really want to say about things. Um, so uh, thank you very much. Thank you for the talk, Colin. Um, are there any questions for Colin? May I ask one question already? Um, let's see. It was the first question. Uh, the reef product, the permutation reef product we have. One thing that I wanted to know, uh, when you have in your paper, you define it using some properties of the line, like the functions, the support of them, or some point inside them. Yeah. I want to, to know if there is another way that is, uh, I don't I, another way to define it. Because one of the things I was thinking about in, in what I'm working with is kind of adapting this argument for uh, other groups, maybe. Like I have the signature and then I work, want to work with these structures. So I yeah. think this would be interesting to Whoa. So um, I, I, I have two, two things to say. Uh, one of them is, is uh, like, uh, I guess, hopefully aspirational and positive for you. And the other one is, is a note of caution. <laughs> okay. So the aspirational positive thing I'd like to say is that the, uh, there, there's laid out, if you, if you look in Bryn's older paper on the elementary immutable subgroups, um, like he, he was able to find in that, in that paper uh, elementary meanable subgroups up to omega squared. Obviously, we've gone like we've gone way, way past that now, right? But in that paper, he defines this thing called a pre-wreath structure, which lays out exactly this the information, the data you need to be able to build the permutation of wreath products that arise. Um, and I'm sure that that very, very he just lays it out as a general structure because if you know Brin at all, this is like what he does. So he like says this is exactly the gen generic structure that you need in order to get these permutation reef products and he says exactly what it is. So um, so I think that you might want to look that at it there if you're going to generalize the, the construction. Um, the, the note of caution is uh, it's a result of, of mine um, from like 2005 that Z wreath Z squared where Z squared is on the top uh, doesn't embed in PL um, homeomorphisms of the of the line or in F for that matter, and so you you know you have to be really careful with these wreath products because in that, if you were just doing standard restricted wreath products, as soon as the top group contained a Z squared, you'd be done. You wouldn't be able to have it, right? So the so it's 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 a subtle thing. You have to be really careful um, when you're doing it. So you know, go for it, but be careful. <laughs> um, Right, uh, and I hope that helps. Oh, and so the, the main uh, reason that we're using these points in the interval is because there is like, uh, if you take the set of markers and you take the full orbit of your set of markers under the group action, then part of our faithfulness argument for the fast groups paper 
says that um, if you're if you're a, a non-trivial element in your group, then um, there is a point in the orbit of the set of markers. So like you take your set of markers, you throw it to another set, and that's a point in the orbit. So there is such a set which is moved by your element. Um, they're not all moved, but some there is always an existing one. And so the set of um, the orbit of the set of markers it makes a nice structure for building your supporting your permutation wreath product, uh, and it's very natural in this context. Um, okay, that's okay. what I have to say about that. I guess. Any other questions for Colin? Well, if not, let's thank Colin again. Nice talk, and thanks, guys. Let's meet in two weeks.